I'm Dr. Ronston Lobo. I'm a cardiology fellow and a clinician investigator at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Today with me, we have Dr. Ballantyne. Professor Ballantyne is a chief of cardiovascular research at the Baylor College of Medicine in Texas. And today he's going to talk to us about his late-breaking clinical trial on all BCSK9 inhibitors. Professor Ballantyne, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. All right. So for those for, uh, for you who are not very familiar, could you kind of briefly explain to us what oral PCSK9 inhibitors are? Well, as you know, we've had only injectable PCSK9 inhibitors. And so the approach has been to use, we've got two fully human monoclonal antibodies, and then we have a small interfering RNA, and they're both injections. So it turns out there have been attempts to make an oral molecule to inhibit PCSK9, but it's very challenging uh, in, in terms of the basically the way PCSK9 interacts with the LDL receptor. So I've, I've been in this area a long time, and probably 10 years ago I was told by some very knowledgeable people that it, it's impossible to make uh, an oral inhibitor, a small right. molecule inhibitor. So what was interesting is the how biotechnology keeps advancing. You know, we have fully human monoclonals. We started off with murine and chimeric and then human eyes and fully human. And then we had the sRNAs where they got the Galnac to improve it. So th there is a development of a way to screen basically these macrocyclic peptides where they basically attach an mRNA to it, but, that, but they were able to screen a library of 10 to the 14. So an incredible number of these molecules find what, what was an inhibitor, and then the medicinal chemists figured out ways to modify the structures to enhance basically making it a better drug. And that has to do with absorption and then, you know, in terms of the elimination and protease. So it's a really a fascinating story of this kind of biotechnology and medicinal chemistry coming up to making something that could be an oral agent. Uh, that's the background of the and, and this was presented as a phase one at the AHA. Understand, in November of last yes, year. Yes, correct. that's right. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. So with regards to the study that, you're, that you'll be talking about uh, as a late-breaking presentation, would you like to describe to us the results of your, fi of your yeah, study? So this was a phase two study to be looking at what's the optimal dose. And it's an interesting in that so it's a four-to-one randomization. There were four doses, 6, 12, 18, 30 milligrams, once daily. Uh, versus placebo. So four to one randomization. And there are about 75 per group. And the, the concept was to look at this in a broad range of individuals. And I, I think that was a very nice thing about the design is uh, to make it, you know, we want to have, even early on, we want to have studies that are more inclusive. So this study had 49% women. Uh, so right off the bat. And then in terms of the background, it was about... 16% Asian, 40% Hispanic, 65% white. So a very broader, representative a, yeah, a broader, population. A broader, and then also in terms of the, the, you had about 38, 39% who had ASCBD clinical. Then you had over 7.5% risk with over 50%. And you had you had a smaller number who were in that five to 7.5. And so by you know as you know we have different levels of LDL, so you could have different ranges of LDL to get in the study, and you had some people who were also um, not on statins or on lower or moderate intensity statins, so you had a mixture of background statin therapy, so I think it's, it was very, I think a, a nice thing to try to see the applicability towards larger patient populations uh, uh, for it. Now the findings were that there, even at the 6 milligram dose, uh, there was a a little over 41% reduction compared to placebo, and at the top dose of 30 milligrams, 61% LDL cholesterol reduction compared to placebo, and also very large reductions, if you look at the top dose of APOB, around 52%, non-HDL cholesterol around 56%, so all of the atherogenic parameters that we look at clinically, LDL, non-HDLC, APOB, with excellent reductions, similar to the injectable monoclonal antibodies.
Wow, that's excellent. So it's across the board, very similar to the injectable PCSK9 inhibitors, Correct. and you're finding very good results in this. This is excellent. So, you know, if I were to take a step from this, how do you think the oral PCSK9 inhibitors would impact the field of lipid therapy and, and going so, forward? So, as you know, these the PCSK9 inhibitors are really outstanding agents in regards to their efficacy. And the profile's been very good. The uptake has not been as much as we would have liked. Right. Uh, so uh, the thought ends up being is that, you know, some people prefer oral agents. Uh, that's one aspect. The other one is uh, basically accessibility. And, and some of this has to do perhaps with the pricing and of injectables. So we'll have to see. But I know one of the, the goals of developing something like this is that you could have an oral agent that might be broadly you know, have a broad impact in regards to various patient populations in the future uh, with it. So this is, I think what you, you start off in multiple steps. The first thing is taking a look at uh, phase 2B, is looking at what kind of doses. In fact, at the 12 milligrams, you're getting over 50% reduction. So lower doses is we're getting quite good reductions. You want to figure out what's a, what dose can you go into a phase 3, and then the phase 3 program being designed by, you know, Merck's looking at what's the best way to see how this is going to fit into practice. But we, we would love to have a therapy. So if you've seen, you know, in clinics, it said, uh, hopefully find something where the prior authorization process is not quite so burdensome. Right. Uh, and that, you know, that could be a little easier for people to, to write and to get access to. It's been an access problem. And then we'll have to see where the future goes. But I think more options. We saw some exciting data at this meeting that, uh, non-statin therapies on statin intolerant patients had benefit, yep. and that was with a reduction of LDL of, you know, 22%. So if you were to get big reductions, we, you know, the reduction was a proportionate to the LDL reduction in terms of the, the risk reduction. So it, I think it would be potentially uh, useful to have uh, to have something else that would be like this. Yeah, no, this is excellent, and yeah, you're absolutely right with regards to the prior authorizations, the, the the prescribing of these medications, they can be a little bit difficult. I, I suppose the storage issue can be too, because with these uh, injectable PCSK9s, you have to store them in a in a refrigerated so temperature. If you're traveling sometimes, and, and you know, so these types of things uh, with it. So, you know, we'll, we'll have to see how things unfold. But we do know that pills are, some people are used to taking pills, and you can take a fairly large quantity when you're traveling and it's, exactly. it's pretty simple you already take them anyway you take it, it takes some more in the morning or whatever exactly well thank you so much for describing the results to us um, one final question for you so you know preventive cardiology is a field that I believe is not you know not looked upon it's not as sexy as the interventional field it has a lot of importance I think and underutilized and I think there's a lot of research like what you're showing us today and all the research that's coming out that that brings preventive cardiology into an important and pre an eminent field, actually. So there is increasing interest, and among fellows especially, we are interested in getting into this field. In fact, I myself am getting into the Preventive Cardiology Fellowship Program at Mayo in July. So for those of us who want to get involved in the field of preventive cardiology, as, you know, a world expert on this, how would you, uh, what advice would you give to us? Well, you know, I think, obviously, prevention is incredibly important. Uh, you know, as, as someone with a very bad family history of heart disease and diabetes, uh, mo most of our patients are going to either die of cardiovascular disease or cancer. Now, we know how to prevent cardiovascular disease, so that we don't know how to prevent most cancers. Yes, smoking cessation, but, you know, so what the impact is, and I can see it in my career, has been we've made extraordinary progress, and it's going to continue because now it's not just prevention of ASCBD, prevention of heart failure. We've Absolutely. got tools to do this now. So I think it's a, it's a, the patients love it. Uh, society needs it. It's the right thing to do. Now the challenge is how do you get paid to do it and make a career out of it? Uh, so I have struggled with this. I've been the you know, chief of cardiology, I've just stepped down, but for over a decade and Unfortunately, I have the worst work or use of anybody in cardiology. <laughs> uh, so this is one of the challenges is how do you do something where you can embrace your passion, provide something really important to patient care and to institutions. Uh, so I think there's ways of doing it. One of them is if you have, for example, non-invasive skills, you can practice prevention 
very easily as part of your routine. You can do your you know, reading of echoes and nucleus or CT, MRI. Those are useful skills for risk assessment uh, yep. for it. Uh, and, and then you can be also having a prevention. And you can do it in many different ways. I think, to be honest with you, we joke that interventional cardiology, are, are, for example, our prevention fellowship is truly being an interventional in terms of atherosclerosis and disease. Uh, right. It's not as exciting as uh, putting in stents, but uh, so I, I, it ta- but it takes a strategy, looking at how you're gonna do this in practice, uh, if you have a passion, it's important. It will work out. It does take a commitment to it. And then uh, uh, the field's going to keep going. And if you're going to do academics, what's your, who are your research mentors? How do you fit into the program? Can you be involved with research and patient care? Uh, the other one is from the quality perspective. I think there's going to be more and more healthcare systems wanting people who can help implement right. quality. So you can be someone who's in health outcomes research. is another very good Salim Verani was one of my fellows, and he's done a tremendous job in more on the health outcomes research side. I've been more on the translational and clinical research with some basic research, but there's many different ways of pursuing this. Uh, you're not going to probably be making as much as some of your colleagues. If I hopefully things will become better about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it hasn't happened, and I've been doing it for a long time, but the issue is you will have an exciting and rewarding career. Yep. It's going to get better and better. And uh, ultimately, if you're doing something that helps your patients, there's a lot of value in that yep. uh, for it. And it's also obviously, you know, strategies where you can work with industry, for example. That's exactly right. So the, what ends up happening is, is that the knowledge that you have as a cardiologist and, you know, you're seeing patients, you see where the unmet needs are. Right. So that's invaluable perspective uh, for it. So I, I do think it's a very exciting area. Now, now organizations, the ASPC, good organization to get involved with. The National Lipid Association, yep. another good organization to get involved with. And, of course, ACC also uh, yes. in terms of networking and building career and more people. Uh, and, you know, social media uh, might be something to, to be thinking about. Twitter, we didn't used to do Twitter, but uh, we got involved because our fellowship program director says, listen, we got to... Everybody else is doing it, so you guys all on the faculty need to step up, and you right. know, and, and it's important uh, in terms of networking. Professor Ballantyne, thank you very much again for joining us. Really appreciate your time. Uh, if you'd like more information, uh, our Twitter handle is Fits on the Go at Fits on the Go, and if you want to see further videos, including this one, it's at YouTube.com/slash Fits on the Go.